welcome to QI, where tonight we're trundling along on trains, trams and tractors to territories beginning with tea. Let's meet my fellow travellers, an intrepid adventurer, Carrie Ann Lloyd. <laughs> A fearless circumnavigator, Jamie MacDonald. <laughs> Boldly going where no man has gone before. <laughs> <laughs> and still putting his trainers on, it's Alan Davis! <laughs> right, time to come and blow your horns, Tom goes. <laughs> <Your pardon>. <laughs> <laughs> Quite butch, <laughs> Very butch, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, all the nice boys like a sailor. <laughs> goes <laughs> and Jamie goes <laughs> oh, I was just coping with being in London <laughs> <laughs> and Alan goes That's my funeral song, actually. I've only played it my funeral. <laughs> now, it might surprise you that I like a big horn, so <laughs> I have decided this week uh, to have one as well. Oh. <laughs> oh, <you're laughs> crazy, <don't you? laughs> right, question one. Can you tell me everything you know about the Tour de France? <laughs> yes, carry on. Yellow jerseys. That's everything I know about the Tour de France. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, there's a picture of a man in a yellow jersey, so that's <laughs> yeah. just said what she knows. I think I probably should get out now that I can't see in case everyone thinks you've been really pat tonight. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> that's, that's handy, yeah. <laughs> I knew that before the picture. Did I have, you? I have actually been suffered by my late father to be forced to watch the Tour de France. He was a, like a triathlete and was training for an Ironman was very into watching other men do the thing that he liked doing at the weekend. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> I've, I've tried a lot of things, but I've never tried Athlon. Oh. <laughs> I read Lance Armstrong's book, and from that book, which is really, really interesting, I found out all about the Tour de France and it being a cycling race around France, but I'm suspicious of mm. you and your question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suspicious that there might be another Tour de France that we don't know about. Uh, well, no, we are talking about the Tour de France. They had a stage in Essex, around Epping Forest. <laughs> The interesting thing about Lance Armstrong is that in the list of tour winners, the most common name is... Lance. No, the answer is... <laughs> Jeff. Jeff, I like that. <laughs> uh, the answer is nobody. Because after the revelation of Lance Armstrong's uh, doping, seven successive races were declared to be officially without a winner. So the, <laughs> so the person who's most won the Tour de France is nobody. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. He was also married to Sheryl Crow, and I think that's really interesting. There were definitely an item. Oh, I thought they were married. They might have been. When uh, your predecessor in that chair, Sandy, yeah. yes. Mr Fry, was asked to appear on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, right. he snubbed my advances to oh. be his partner. <laughs> and he asked uh, Nigella Lawson, well, why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. And then the question came up, who is Lance Armstrong's girlfriend, basically? Right. Uh, and I was sitting at home and going, that would be Cheryl, Cheryl Crow. Crow. I know that Cheryl yeah. Crow. I've had a crush on her since 1994. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> stunning. She's stunning. And they didn't get it. And he oh. went out on about 1,200 quid. I laughed oh. and laughed. <laughs> uh, so, does anybody know how the tour began? Ready, steady, go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you an initial point. I thought that was very, very good. <laughs> so, it began... It's not a tour, though, is it? It's not a tour. Uh, so why is it called... It is a tour, isn't it? They're not state? stopping to go, look, there's the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> no. there's the no. Champs-Élysées. They're not doing any sort of touring. No. Imagine going on a, on a bicycle tour of a city and then everybody else is, like, trying to elbow you out the way. <laughs> Everybody's on drugs. <laughs> it's a nightmare. 
<laughs> but the interesting thing is it began as an argument between two newspapers. So in 1894, France was absolutely convulsed by something called the Dreyfus Affair. Does anybody remember the Dreyfus Affair? The one where the guy was sent off to an island yes. in exile. I yes. do know that, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Alfred Dreyfus was a Jewish army captain. He was accused of spying and it absolutely divided French society. There were those who thought that he was a traitor and those who thought he was a victim of anti-Semitism. And weirdly, it started the Tour de France. <laughs> so there was a cycling magazine called Le Vélo, which is the bicycle, and the editor, Pierre Giffard, was very pro-Dreyfus. That's him there. And one of its major backers, Albert de Dion, he was actually arrested for demonstrating against Dreyfus's pardoning. And de Dion pulled his advertising and set about establishing a rival newspaper called Lotto. Car. So the new magazine was edited by a man called Henri Desgranges and as a publicity stunt for the new magazine, bearing in mind this is a magazine called The Car, he decided to start a gruelling 19-day bicycle race. <laughs> <laughs> this was in 1903 and it absolutely worked. Lavello folded as a publication in the next year. It's an incredible race. You can see it goes all around France. I think we have a picture of the very first winner. There he is, Maurice Gahan. He looks uh, absolutely knackered. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually the one in the polar neck. Did you call it a polar bicycle? neck, not a roll neck? <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's very difficult to know what a polar neck is in a polar shirt. Yes. I get very confused and nothing to do with polar. It's got a hole in it. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much. In 1910, they decided to make the race even harder <laughs> than bicycling all the way around France, and the tour went up into the high mountains for the first time, the 2100-metre Col de Tourmelet, which is down in the Pyrenees in the south there. They stopped for luncheon. <laughs> well, there was a writer called Alphonse Stenet, and he wanted to do a recce to make sure that it was safe to do this. So he got stuck in the snow, he abandoned his car, he fell into a ravine, he nearly died of <laughs> hypothermia, he was found by a search party at 3am, and he sent a telegram back to the editor that read, Tourmalet crossed, very good road, perfectly passable. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the attitude we need! <laughs> Has anybody ever been on a racing bicycle? I have not. Oh, yeah. Yeah? I've never been on one. It's Darling, have you seen the height of them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife and I did a triathlon. I've been on a, on a, on a racing tandem round the, uh, the Chris Hoy velodrome. And oh, that, wow. I, that, I, I've, never, I've never shot myself. So much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the guy said, now, what you'll notice about this bike is there's no brakes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and we started going and you're going about 30 miles an hour within about oh five seconds it was horrible and then the back wheel bounced and well yeah, that'll we be all the shit everywhere yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> does anybody know the name of the first Briton to win the Tour de France yeah. is it Bradley Wiggins First Claxon of the evening, it is not Bradley Wiggins anymore for anymore. I'm going to give you a clue. It's a great feminist fact. Um, yeah. Ooh. Is it Emmeline Pankhurst? <laughs> <laughs> it was a woman called Millie Robinson who won the Women's Tour in 1955. She was the first British person to do so. Mm -hmm. She was a, a van driver from the Isle of Man, in case you're curious. <laughs> oh, well, that's um, cheating, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why nobody took it seriously, because it's an uneven race. Well, um, yeah, in France, if women did it and then a British person won, I imagine they were like, the, the, we're never doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I, I say the event organiser did not help. He was called Jean Lulieu, and he wrote, I will never organise this race again. Women are different from men. They talk too much in the peloton. It's not normal. In addition, <laughs> once the racing is over, they do not rest as they should, uh, but fatigue their legs by going shopping. <laughs> oh, and then he went on to appear in Hello, Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Alan, which of your skills is also on view on the Tour de France every year? My skills? Your particular skills. My particular skills? Yeah. You have a pad and pen in front of you. What yes. do you tend to draw in there? Oh, a cock and ball. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, row two. <laughs> <laughs> cock and balls. Yeah. That's two for one. me. Epic Forest, cock and balls. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> oh, you've given me a dad pen so I can't draw. Oh, it happens to all men. It's not a big deal. <laughs> They have a small team of effaceurs, okay, erasers, to camouflage phallic <gasps> graffiti along the route. It is a long standing tradition that spectators paint the names of their favourite riders on the track. Unfortunately, it's three and a half thousand kilometres, so there's an awful lot of unwanted graffiti. So painters drive ahead of the cyclists <laughs> and turn what they call le six uh, into <laughs> butterflies and owls. <laughs> Giant faces. That's what I've been trying to draw <laughs> all these <laughs> It's not very good at owls. Oh, all French butterflies have one eye. It's yes. Weird. <laughs> now we know what the ladies were talking about in the palace. <laughs> <laughs> what I love is they drive two hours ahead of the race and then they have to drive back because people are behind putting more penises. <laughs> so the Tour de France has a special team of workmen whose job is to hide the tools. <laughs> <laughs> what use is a tandem in love or in war? Is it... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tom. <laughs> Whenever I walk into a room, that's the sound. Tom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll help me out very much. <laughs> I'll just Tom. Uh, yes. Hello. <laughs> yes. We should oh, all do this. We just oh. walked into the room. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> see you. Hang see on. You. I'm just going to do mine. I'll see. It's Sandy, we've got a party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what use is a tandem in love or indeed in war? I imagine they're a great source of arguments, aren't they? In a tandem, if you're on it with a couple. Jamie, you did. Yeah, a I mean, I, I, we did. When, once we got on the road, when we did the tandeming, my, my wife, we, we wobbled a bit, and she went, "Shit, shit, stop, stop, stop!" And I put my foot down, and she went, "Shit, shit, stop, stop!" Does not mean stop. So, yeah, it can turn love into war. It was actually used in war. The Boer War was the very first conflict where tandems were commonly used. The Royal Australian Cycle Corps had a war cycle, so it was a double tandem. So two tandems bolted together. This is actually a tricycle. But it could be fitted with a Maxim machine gun down oh the middle. God. And the wheels were adapted, so it could also go on the railway tracks. And then it doubled as an ambulance. You could take the gun off and put a stretcher on in place. And they were also used to generate electricity, uh, particularly in the First World War. They used a static tandem bike attached to a dynamo, and then you could power, for example, a radio station might be a good thing. But in the late 19th century, these two-person bikes and cycling in general became incredibly popular with young people. Now, this there one... they are, young people. <laughs> <laughs> what, what we've got, Jamie, is we've got a man and a woman on a two-person tricycle, which was known as a sociable, followed by a woman on a bicycle by herself who looks very grumpy. But there were opportunities for young people to go on a tandem and be followed by a chaperone. So this was a chance to do some uh, flirtation, uh, if you like, uh, on the bicycle. It's quite difficult to be flirtatious when you're going along in a tandem. And there's another cock in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one way to get the girl, isn't it? Yeah. But there was actually a chaperone cyclists association formed wow. in 1896 and they used to supply, I like the spinsters over 30, to accompany young ladies on their bicycles. Uh, what do you call a tandem with three riders? Uh, oh. Tridum. <laughs> Tri Triandum. What does tandem mean? Anybody know? Two, two, two on a bike. No, it just means the riders are sitting one in front of another. Oh. So a tandem with three seats is still a tandem. tandem. So tandem comes from Latin and uh, it means length really or at length. There used to be a thing where horses would be one behind the other and they would have been <laughs> in tandem. So we have a carriage with one horse in front of the other, that's tandem. Tandem cycling was an Olympic event from 1908 in London until Munich in 1972. I have to say there were some athletes who treated it as a bit of a joke. At Helsinki in 1952, there were two Australian athletes called Lionel Cox and Russell Mockridge, and they decided to compete despite never having ridden on a tandem bike until the week before. And they borrowed a bicycle from the British team and promptly won gold in the... <laughs> 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 wow. 2,000 meter event. <laughs> if you want to take up professional tandem cycling, you'll have to get in line. <laughs> <laughs> what was the toughest obstacle faced by the first train to go all the way around the world? Is, was... it, is it ticketing? Because it's technically both a return and a single. <laughs> <laughs> There was a guy, a guy called George Francis Train. He was an American entrepreneur. In 1870, he circumnavigated the world. He is 
the person who inspired Jules Verne ah. to write Phileas Fogg. Um, his name was George Francis Train. Train, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. What a chance. It yeah. <laughs> it's a fantastic trip. It took a long time going round, mm. partly because he was arrested and held in Lyon Bastille for 13 <laughs> days. Did he give it a bad review on TripAdvisor? Yes, <laughs> oh, not so <laughs> terrible. So what kind of transport did George Train introduce to Britain? Introduced a mode of transport to Britain yes. never seen before. Yeah. Paragliding. <laughs> Ooh, it's Funicular. Funicular. Oh, I get it. I like just that word, no. Oh. Um, oh, no. <laughs> sorry. Uh, train ran Britain's very first successful tram. Oh, oh of course. Oh. Did you go, how did you describe it? It's like, it's like a train. Yeah, it's a bit like a train. It goes on the road. What do you um, call it? Tram. tram. <laughs> so his first tram was in Birkenhead. And what I love about this, he was he obviously thought big, George. Uh, he invited all of the crowned heads of Europe <laughs> to come to Birkenhead <laughs> to help open the tram. <laughs> Unbelievably, not one of them turned oh. up. <laughs> I know. Oh, uh, no, King of Spain hasn't turned up. <laughs> <laughs> Princess of Sweden said yes, but I think it's a maybe. <laughs> <laughs> he then set up a line from Marble Arch to Bayswater in London. Very popular, except with wealthy residents who had to cross the line to get to Hyde Park. They could not tolerate these new vehicles hogging a fixed section of the road on rails sticking up above the road surface and proving an obstacle to carriages. It's also not very far, is it, Marble Arch to Bayswater? I know. We're off! Yeah. We're here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was arrested for, and I love this, oh, no. breaking and injuring the Uxbridge Road. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a wonderful character. He's wonderfully eccentric. He used to like to shake hands with himself. What? He was. <laughs> 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 How are you doing? Is that uh, a euphemism, Sandy? <laughs> Journey a long time <laughs> zone. <laughs> what are you doing in there? I'm yeah. taking hands with myself. <laughs> Get out of my tram. <laughs> <laughs> There's not such thing as a tram, you dirty bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I've just invented it. I'm going to face water. <laughs> it's also... It's only up the road. Leave me alone. <laughs> I didn't finish until you came. <laughs> 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 Train was arrested again in the United States. He was described... Quite rightly so. Yes. <laughs> he was declared a lunatic for supporting Victoria... <laughs> he was... It's because a he was harsh. Well, he was a supporter of uh, the women's suffrage movement, and there was a suffragist called Victoria Woodhull, who was the very first woman to run for president back in 1872, and he was arrested because he was a lunatic for supporting her. But he wasn't in favour of all women. He was outraged by another woman who's a sort of QI favourite, which is Nellie Bly. Anybody know anything about... Nellie Bly? Alan, can you remember anything about Nellie Bly? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, she... In one ear and out the other. Wasn't she an elephant? <laughs> <laughs> she was a writer, and she, as a stunt for the New York World newspaper in 1889, she went round the world in 72 days. Oh. And Train responded immediately by making two much quicker journeys, because he couldn't bear it that somebody else had oh, done it. God. Oh. He was no longer the guy. There's a guy called James Holman. He was an explorer, and in 1832, he became the very first blind person to circumnavigate the globe. He lost his sight in the Navy aged 25. So he left, he attended medical school, and he spent the next 40 years travelling. Oh. I mean, it's a fantastic story. He was in, uh, imprisoned in Siberia as a spy. He had a river named after him in Equatorial Guinea. He published five volumes of memoirs. And I love this. He claimed he could tell a person's social status by the sound of their footsteps. <laughs> See, this, this is what they told him. He had no idea where he went. No. He sailed up and down Loch Lomond for five years. <laughs> they put different spaces under his nose. That's you in China now. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, look at this. <laughs> yeah, it's magic. I'm going to become a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think happens in a tram driving competition? Uh, yes, somebody right. wins. Yeah. Yeah, not what I was expecting, but that is oh. correct. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose that is correct. Yeah. Well, well, well. <laughs> yeah. So there's an annual competition called the European Tram Driver Championships. Do you have to do this, for example, different disciplines, stopping within 20 centimetres of a cone without hitting it? Oh, tough, quite tough. Good. Mm. Accelerating to exactly 30 kilometres per hour without a speedometer. Breaking by eye to get as close as possible to a marked spot on the ground. But my favourite, which is, I think, the most crowd-friendly event, tram 10-pin bowling. 
<laughs> Drivers have to shunt massive bowling balls towards skittles to knock them down, but without hitting the skittles themselves with the tram. Wow. I always feel like our trams are a bit apologetic, aren't they? They should have a louder horn, considering they are going along normal roads and yeah. you don't expect to see a train there. Now they just go... Shame they're not a bus or a tube. It's yeah, they're like, like, they're like sorry. Just... <laughs> 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 when trams were introduced in the United States, there was an anxiety that passengers might be hit by a tram. Mm. There was a suggestion they should put a sofa on the front of the tram to, <laughs> so, <laughs> to scoop people up <laughs> out of the way. That's a very good idea. I think it's a marvelous idea. That's how someone died in Carnation Street. Who remembers? Someone really oh, famous yeah, died, got tram, hit by yeah. a tram. Who was it? Alan Bradley. No, it was. Yeah. He was evil as Rita Faircross boyfriend. Yes, Rita's boyfriend, thank yeah. you. Yes, yeah. Got hit by a tram in Blackpool. He didn't, it was satisfying. <laughs> he was awful to Rita. Wasn't he? She was with Mavis. Oh, yeah, there was Mavis, Mavis right. as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But wasn't there a coronation? Oh, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> I was also... I was going to say about Judy Garland as well. Oh, now like, you're talking. Now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and she was when in was Coronation she... Street. <laughs> <laughs> Judy she Garland. went out with um, Ken. <laughs> Ken. Everyone went out with Ken. Judy yeah, she was married to Ken just yeah. before Deirdre. No, um, <laughs> Judy Garland sang about being... Oh, she called it a trolley. Bang, she bang, sang bang, bang, met the trolley. Yeah, yeah lovely ding, song. Ding, ding, goes the bell. It's so ding, cute. Ding, ding, goes my heart rings from the moment I saw him, my bell. Song. All that's happening is she's just trying to pick up some bloke on the tram. Yeah, but she goes to the something. end of the line. Yeah, and yeah like, well, we all have done that, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I forget to buy a ticket. <laughs> but she's not just terrified on the sofa at the front getting yeah. further along the street. <laughs> right. What's weird about that song is she's just telling people. Like, the whole the whole tram, she's just telling them all about the And they're all going all love it. And they're just like, yeah, tell me more. <laughs> Which, if you do that on the tube, does not happen. <laughs> <laughs> George Train travelled the world in 80 days. What a marvellous piece of nominative determinism. Why, if he'd been called George Rail Replacement Bus Service, <laughs> <laughs> he might never have made it. Now, George Train travelled by tram, but what kind of tractor can't move anything heavier than an ant? Is it a tractor beam? It is a tractor beam. No way, but it can move the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. <laughs> okay, do you think it is just a matter of science fiction? The Millennium mm, Falcon? No, no. Not, not... <laughs> no. <laughs> Since you mentioned Such... the ant... Can it move a deck as well? No. <laughs> it can only move ant, not deck. <laughs> so we are talking about tractor beams, so those are devices that move objects using a beam of energy. Now, up until fairly recently, they were confined to the realms of science fiction, but Professor Bruce Drinkwater and his team at Bristol University have made one. Uh, it consists of hundreds of tiny little loudspeakers. They generate sounds that are louder than a jet engine, but they are too high-pitched for the human ear to be able to detect it. And these sound waves, they surround an object, holding it in place, basically in a sort of invisible cage. An actual uh, tractor beam. Well, let's uh, find out. Please welcome Professor Bruce Drinkwater. <laughs> <laughs> right, Bruce, tell me what you are holding in your hand. Well, this is the tractor beam. I mean, uh, it looks like a piece of wood with a bit of wire on it. Yes, it's a low-cost, battery-powered version. You can make it at home if you want. Amazing. So, you've got in this box here, you've got little tiny polystyrene balls. Yep, uh, polystyrene balls. So, <laughs> if you just pick one up for us... Oh, right. ..and then just drop it down. We can see it just drops, right? And the idea is that you're going to use the tractor beam to make this hover in the air, is that right? It is indeed, yes. OK. Is it on? It's not. I'll I mean, it I on. can't tell. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Can you hear it now? Oh. No. Oh, uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> So, inside there, lots and lots of tiny little speakers, is that right? Exactly. They're all outputting ultrasounds. That's... You can't hear it, hopefully. What could hear it? Bats, uh, okay. dogs and cats. Right, so the, the theory is that you're going to pick up one of these polystyrene balls and make it hover in the air. Exactly. So, as you said, there's a, there's a sound field in there with a little quiet region surrounded by a very loud region. And so I'm going to try to put the little object in the quiet region. You've just got to find the exact spot for it. There we go. Oh! Ooh. That is extraordinary! <laughs> Like a magic trick, I want to know there's no wires or anything that I can't see. Can you show right. me? Right, well, this is a wire loop. 
Yeah. And hopefully we can. Uh, whoa, oh. Wow. <laughs> so, so what? What? That is extraordinary. <laughs> You what can, is, so what's holding it in place? It's the sound itself making a very, very careful pattern, which is sort of a bit like where the particle is, it's like noise cancellation, so there's no sound, and then around it, it's very loud. So we've sort of sculpted a sound field uh, I, around I, the particle. So I think of a tractor beam as, as drawing it towards, but it seems to be pushing it away. It might look like it's pushing it away, but the real proof of a tractor beam is it's got to be able to pull something, and that will mean that it beats gravity. So if I turn this over, Ooh. hopefully you can see it's <laughs> beating gravity. And if I press this button here, yeah. it will pull the particle up. No! <laughs> Oops, oh, there it dropped out. <laughs> practical uh, extrapolations from this? Could you make a giant one, for example? You could make a giant one, and that might be able to replace robots, you know, for make tiny things. You know, all your electronics are getting smaller, so you want tools to be able to handle those. You can also make smaller versions of this that can move really, really small things, like cells and microparticles, okay. viruses, potentially. So you're looking at something in a microscope that you can't manipulate, but you might be able to with a tractor beam. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. So at the moment, using a microscope is a one-way process. You look at something, but you can't really interact with it very easily. But with sound waves like this, all shrunk down into the microscope, you, you could. And you can move things, prod things, and you can even assemble them together, potentially to form the starting point for new tissues to grow, like new muscles. <laughs> It's mind-blowing. Uh, how much to make one of those for yourself? This, uh, the parts are about £100. Wow. That's not so bad. That, that's we amazing. Can, we can club together and make one of those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Professor Drinkwater, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's venture a little further afield on our travels. Where would you go to find the most leaning tower in the world? <laughs> Go for it, Carrie Ed. Pizza! Hey! Not pizza? Not pizza, I'm <laughs> guessing. Do you know, years ago, I was in Florence and I went to the train information place and I said I'd like to get the next train to Pisa, please. And the man said that the next train is uh, at uh, 5 past 11. I said, but it's 5 past 12 now. He went, ah, oh, you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the, the ones? Is, is it Malaysia? Is it those Petronas towers? Is it something like there's something built in? So if there's a cyclone, it'll bend like a frickin' palm tree, but you don't have to shit yourself because it'll spring right back up. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about a building that was specifically built. Uh, the most deliberately inclined structure in the world is the Montreal Tower. Uh, it is 165 metres high and it sits at a 45 degree <gasps> angle. <gasps> Yeah. Anyone else feel like they wanted to vomit when they saw that? Yeah. <laughs> but the thing about it is, in a way, it's sort of cheating, isn't it? Because it was deliberate. I like the ones that are supposed to be straight. There's one in Shanghai called the Hushu Pagoda that leans the most. It's about seven degrees. Ooh. So if you think of the Tower of Pisa, it's about four degrees. This is seven. It was built in 1709. Tilted over, I like this, when they uh, set off some firecrackers and it burnt down its wooden supports. <laughs> Pisa isn't even the most leaning tower in Europe. That's the church tower of Serkusen in Germany, which is <laughs> least <laughs> five points. So, uh, again... Not as photogenic as Pisa. <laughs> <laughs> that car in front of it really doesn't set it off in the same way. <laughs> so Pisa's tower originally lay the other way. Construction was started in 1173, and after just five years and three stories, imagine they've been... What it started that? tilting north. What is that man doing? It looks like he's grabbing some boots. <laughs> It's those things where you take a photo and it looks as though you're holding the tower yes, up. Even I know you don't grab a tower like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it started leaning straight away because the ground they built it on was too soft to hold the weight and they started putting tapered blocks in and they kept doing that for 200 years wow. and it no longer tilted north, it tilted south <laughs> instead. I've been up it, it's only got a little railing. There's nothing to protect you. I thought it'd be a bit more Ooh. to it. Yeah. And once you get near the top... <laughs> People should, surely would be fall, but they don't fall out. No. I mean, it's, it is famous for leaning. It is. So you think you've but had your warning. You get to the top. <laughs> <laughs> but you do find yourself going, this is really leaning over, isn't it? <laughs> you couldn't you can really fall off the top and go, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> said, this is dangerous. <laughs> late, great Barry Cryer, I remember I said to him once, I said, how did you know when you were writing, like you were writing for the Russ Abbott show, that you'd got a great idea for a piece of comedy? He said, 
It was nine o'clock on a Monday morning and we were sitting there and somebody said, Russ Abbott opens a restaurant in the Leaning Tower of Pisa and tries to serve from the dessert trolley. <laughs> 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 Ten past nine, we all went for a beer. Yeah. <laughs> the tower is now stabilised. It was stabilised in 2008 uh, with cables and 600 tonnes of lead counterweights oh. and so on. They had a competition, didn't they, for ideas. Mm. And people submitted ideas of a, a huge statue of a person <laughs> yeah. just holding, it, holding up. it up. But that, surely that person would also start to leave. <laughs> Leans too. Did you know that? Or, oh, uh, I didn't know. Strictly that. speaking, called the Elizabeth Tower. Due to subsidence, engineers <laughs> estimate it'll fall over in about a thousand years. Oh, yeah. Well, that'll be exciting, gone. won't it? When that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, wonder what <laughs> I wonder what time it'll be when it happens. <laughs> Probably a dong of the bell that sends it over the edge. Probably. Yeah, probably. Do you think? <laughs> oh! This one, the clue is in the question. Okay, so I need you to listen very, very carefully. What can be used to deliver the post in Tonga? Mm. <laughs> the clue's in the question. Uh, what delivery van? Can be used. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Ah. Or B. What about a B? A B. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a the answer is... What about electricity, a watt of electricity? It, it is a can. The answer is a can. I'm just going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a can. <laughs> Anybody know anything about Tonga? Where is it? What is it? Anything at it's all? It's in the Pacific. It's an island. Uh, lo loads of islands, isn't Lots it? Islands. Yeah, it's about 170 like islands. Yeah. It's a Polynesian uh, monarchy. So, for about 100 years, the people in the northernmost island of Nuafu, my apologies if I don't get that right, um, sent and received mail via tin cans retrieved from the sea wow. by swimming postmen. Nuafu is a volcanic rim island. So, it lacks a natural harbour, it doesn't have any beaches, impossible to dock a ship. So, that when the postal system began, which is in 1882, passing ships used to throw overboard buoyant uh, biscuit tins, kerosene tins, that sort of thing, filled with letters and they'd put a flag on it attached for visibility. And the strongest swimmers in the island would swim out to retrieve <laughs> the cans and then use a long stick to pass outgoing letters up to the ship's deck. Who it's amazing. Who are they from, the letters? They've never been anywhere. Who are these bloody letters from? <laughs> <laughs> Can you send you a letter? Can you stop sending those letters? You don't know who you are. It's mostly tax demands. Yeah. <laughs> I would have written to them with some plans for the building of a jetty. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, they don't have it anymore. They, um, they now have an airfield. Well, that's quite tricky with that circular runway they have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might be all right for taking off, but landing would be very difficult. <laughs> what do you think they did after one postman was attacked by a shark? They got two postmen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one to distract. Yeah, right, one to... Like. He's that way, quick, quick. They started using canoes. What, they hadn't thought of that before? <laughs> I know. <laughs> they, had, they invented the post before they invented boats. <laughs> <laughs> There's some fascinating bits of Tongan oral history. So, in the 12th century, a piece of wood was briefly named King. <laughs> so, there's a guy called King Talatama, and he had died without any heirs, and his brother, I hope I'm going to say this right, Tala Iha Yapapi, was the obvious next monarch, but there was no precedent for brothers inheriting the throne. It was thought to be a bad omen for the father-son bloodline to be broken, so Tala Ahapi uh, named a wooden block as the previous king's son, and consequently the wooden block became the king. The wooden block was given a wife to marry, uh, <laughs> and the wife and the wooden block adopted the brother <laughs> and thus he became the next king. They really took the idea of the family tree. <laughs> uh, what begins with tea and is a rubbish place to go for a drink? Toilet. Tonga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both Tonga and toilet. Rubbish place to go for a drink. Clues in the question. Rubbish what? place, the tip. Rubbish yes. place. Yes. Oh. Oh. So, in 2019, there was a pop-up cocktail bar called Gomi Pit, and it opened in a Tokyo trash treatment centre mm -hmm. wow. called the Musashino Clean Centre. So, you could sit there and you could have nibbles mm. and have a drink and look through at a giant mechanical claw. Oh, um, every, every now and then there'd be a body part. <laughs> <laughs> in a film, there would be, be having yeah. a drink and there'd be your Auntie Jean. <laughs> 
quite good in terms of how much rubbish we use and how much waste we accumulate. That's exactly the point. And of it. while you're contemplating the end of the world, you can have some nice sushi. Yeah. Why not? Uh, <laughs> have a martini. Yeah. Oh, I love a martini. Wherever I am. So the tip is as good as anywhere. <laughs> But imagine trying to get a mattress out the back of your car piss. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know there's 15% of Tokyo Bay, so that's about 250 square kilometres, is reclaimed land? Yes, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a waste from construction projects. The project started in 1592. What? Uh, it was dirt displaced from a moat dug round uh, the big castle, Edo Castle. Oh, right, yeah. And then they carried on 20th century domestic waste to fill it up. What? And oh. ironically, almost all of Tokyo's waste processing facilities are built on land reclaimed using domestic waste. Oh. There's an artificial island off Tokyo Bay called Yumenoshima uh, Dream Island, and it was built using domestic waste. I think they inserted it between layers of clay, and originally they were going to put an airport there but eventually it just uh, became land film. Looks a bit like Heathrow there. <laughs> it was the setting for the archery and water polo events of the 2020 yeah. Olympics, so it did, it did actually oh, work out. Trying to find your arrows in there. <laughs> <laughs> in Copenhagen, we have a waste-to-energy plant and it converts the town's rubbish into heating and electrical power, which is already fantastic. But the outside is both an artificial ski slope, a hiking trail and the world's tallest artificial climbing wall. It's known as Copen Hill or Amarbaga, and I have skied down the waste processing. Oh. Um, it's the weirdest thing, because you go up and you can see through the glass thing all of the waste being processed, and meanwhile you've got your ski boots on, and then you get to the top and you go come down on your skis. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> Any other skiers? Any other skiers? I've been skiing, yeah. I went with school, and then we all, at the end of it we all got a certificate, and uh, I was the first one to go up and get my certificate, and I didn't know that the French might give you a different greeting when you get a certificate, so she, the lady skier went towards me, and I didn't realize she was trying to give me a kiss on both cheeks, a la European, and so I kissed her on the lips in front of my whole school. <laughs> <laughs> now, after all that travel, it's time to get back to the hotel, but not before a late night stroll down the unnerving alley of general ignorance. So fingers on buzzers, please. Which country has its bagpipe culture protected by UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list. I'll give you a clue. It begins with S. <laughs> yes. Had to, but I, I, but I do think it's Spain. Oh! <laughs> well, why would you say Spain? Because I met a Spanish person and they bored me to shit about how <laughs> uh, bagpipes aren't originated in your country, they're originated in our country, so I, I think it's Spain. I'm going to give you two points for oh. that. Oh. <laughs> They are, in fact, played all over the world and have been for centuries. But when I was looking for the UNESCO cultural intangible, it is bagpiping culture in Slovakia. Oh. It was added to the list in 2015. It's a fantastic list. It was started in 2008. It basically safeguards cultural practices and raises awareness about them. And Slovakian bagpiping has been very, very important in the folk culture from at least the 18th century. And it was ne deemed in need of, uh, of safeguarding. Milan Rusko, who's the secretary of the Slovak Bagpipers Guild, he says that Slovak bagpipes have a very pleasant sound as opposed to the aggressive, strong and noisy sound of Scottish bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he meant. <laughs> I want to introduce that Slovakian to that Spaniard. Yeah. <laughs> Just really that right up. It's a fantastic list. There's beer culture in Belgium. You think, oh, no, fair enough. I like this one. Practices and expressions of joking relationships in Niger. <laughs> so what it is is there's two communities and they don't always get on. What they'll do is they'll find a person in each community to represent them and then they basically take the piss out of each other to stop everybody fighting. It's <laughs> 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 around on uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. I was just about to say! <laughs> There's Mongolian coaxing ritual for camels. Which... Camels! I... <laughs> now, having gone through all of those different intangible cultural things, can you name any of the items on the UK's intangible cultural heritage list? No. Yes, carry on. Moaning. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the weather. Yes. Maybe, like, getting drunk in a, in a <laughs> civic high street. <laughs> <laughs> Irish 
neighbours have three entries. The French have 23. Oh, <laughs> the UK <laughs> has a zero. No. Oh, no, of course oh. we yeah. do. Nothing we have... worth preserving. Oh. No. <laughs> but people don't think we should say that the UK has been very good at looking after its buildings, but yeah. not good at the intangible cultural stuff. So things like, I don't know, Morris dancing, cheese rolling, and that kind of thing. Do you know what? Bothered. <laughs> <laughs> No, we don't have anything. Where was Dracula, Prince of? Um, Transylvania. Yeah! <laughs> no! No! The darkness. <laughs> so the real-life Dracula was Vlad the Third Dracul. Mm. He lived 1431 to 76. He was Vlad the Impaler, basically. Oh. Yes, so named because... He liked to impale? He loved impaling. <laughs> he was born in Transylvania, but he was, in fact, the prince of the neighbouring province of Wallachia. It doesn't have the same ring about it, does no, it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> like, welcome to Wallachia. Wallachia. Yeah. <laughs> they do Mexican street food. Yeah, they, they do. They? <laughs> yeah. He impaled thousands of people uh, in his oh. lifetime. I went to a torture museum in Spain and they had an impaling thing and they could impale you, so it went up through your back and out your shoulder. Oh. And, but you were alive. Oh. oh, that's horrid, isn't it? Yeah. Did they also have bagpipes? <laughs> <laughs> there is a supposed link with Transylvania, Tom. So there's a castle. He definitely didn't live there, Vlad the Third. but they make kind of a big deal out of it. It's mm. called Bran Castle. But it's because Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula, he once saw a drawing of Bran Castle in a book, and that is what he based oh. the home of Dracula on. The actual castle that Vlad the Third lived in is about 150 miles away and is now a ruin. You'd go, wouldn't you? You'd go, yeah, yeah. move back, you ring. Absolutely. <laughs> um, magnet? Maybe some uh, olive sticks. <laughs> <laughs> in 2021, so during the pandemic, the castle offered itself up as a site for people to get free doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Come in, I will vaccinate you. Oh, you pushed that little bit far! <laughs> the doctors wore fake fangs. <laughs> Oh. And then, if you were vaccinated, you got free access to their... Um, they have an exhibition of medieval torture implements. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I and why it. not? And so, footsore but happy, we reach our final destination, the scores. In equal last pace with minus 17, <laughs> it's Tom and Alan! <laughs> Still in the taxi queue at Terminal 5, with minus 13, it's Jamie! <laughs> Traveller triumphant with minus two. It's Gary.